Hello. So, um, I call this uh, the affordable housing tapping into the potential of North Granville. And part of that was also um, the idea of uh, commitment that I, I would be willing to at least talk a little bit about the uh, some of the recommendations that came from the, the uh, committee that was uh, uh, from the executive report from the North Granville Safety and Wellness Council Subcommittee on affordable housing. How do you like that? This is why I have a piece of paper in front of me so I can remember these things. Um, uh, I wanted to try to kind of go over a number of things, and um, that might be of help and usefulness. And if I go off on a spin somewhere in a direction that sounds, well, that's maybe a little hurt. somebody's got to have to wait because, as Robin will attest, I can really go off, especially if you get into issues of youth homelessness and that sort of thing. Um, one of the things that's just really important is, is to know there was a committee that met and, and tried to review some of the the, the existing bylaws and you know, and uh, uh, pieces of paper that, that float around the offices of the uh, council uh, and, uh, to uh, addressing issues regarding housing and housing development in the area and particularly what they were calling affordable housing. And it was important, I just thought it was important to know that we're, there's some pretty amazing people, Heather, and I got to meet Heather there and a number of others um, that were in and out of, of that uh, count, uh, committee working hard. But uh, John Sherritt, who was an amazing fellow, it was the first time I'd ever met, really met him, and uh, he wrote a lot of the material here that I'm going to steal and, and, and try to talk about, because he was the one who, who uh, pulled together the final report and made sure that it was all written up for the, uh, for the council's consideration for their revised official plan. And uh, one of the first things we talked about and, and was the importance of why, uh, um, why it was important to address the issue of planning of, of social housing. And I thought it's in context. I, don't, I think I'm preaching to the choir here. But um, the, um, one of the things that's missed is how important housing is to virtually everything else regarding a person and a, the community's well-being. And um, in the Conference Board of Canada, but no less, the austere Conference Board of Canada, um, reported building from the, in the, from, called Building from the Ground Up, Enhancing Affordable Housing in Canada. Their statement was that their shortage of affordable housing was having a detrimental effect on Canadians' health, which in turn reproduce, reduces their productivity, limits our national competitiveness, and indirectly drives up the cost of health care and welfare. And they added stress, asthma, diabetes have all been linked to inadequate housing. The members of our community that are most vulnerable to the lack of affordable housing in North Grenville's uh, are youth, single parents, the elderly, and low-income families. But that wasn't from the Conference Board of Canada, I'm sorry, that we, I spliced that in from Don's. The other quote came directly from uh, the Conference Board. And the lack of affordable and inadequate housing has been shown to increase the individual's risks of victimization, social disorder, and even harm. And again, that ties very well into the woman who was speaking about the, the woman who had insecure housing because of a, a abusive uh, family, family violence and, and needed to get out and there's, there was nowhere to turn. Um, the whole question, and one of the things that a lot of people are asking, is about affordable housing and why is it so hard to find a solution? And we heard some of the very things, you know, different jurisdictions are involved, etc. But it's an interesting quote um, from, uh, this was from the Canadian Federation of Municipalities. And one of theirs, and they talked about the whole imbalance and problems of it, is that during, this is their quote from one of their documents. During the 1990s, federal deficit cutting cost caused provincial and territorial governments to offload some of their responsibilities to municipal governments without providing resources to meet those responsibilities. And now, just a moment before I go on, when they, and they're talking about the feds, and that's absolutely true. CMHC was really heavily involved, Canadian Mortgage and Housing Corporation, and they did a lot of risk. And they, they report immediately, I mean, there was no such thing anymore for building uh, affordable housing as, as some sort of uh, uh, allowance for communities and transfer payments, etc. What they don't say in this was also that how, how much the province also did very similar. 
uh, and from different and from different angles, where they uh, those were the days of cutting welfare and, and social assistance. Uh, to um, they froze it completely, and some in most cases actually cut it back. So they, they did a double whammy. The province cut back how much money you could possibly get on social assistance at the same time when there was no affordable housing being built, which created an immense crisis, and that you've seen it since the 90s. And there's a very specific reason why you've seen it so much that way. Thank you, Mike Harris. Yeah, exactly. I, you're tr I'm trying to not name names, but it's really, <laughs> we should name really names. hard. There are times, you know, that it's really difficult to not name names. Um, I, you know, and, and we were saying, you know, in the, the discussion about adult homelessness, and this is off track here again, just slight. But one of the issues about adult homelessness is, is the very large percentage of the adult homeless have mental health issues, et cetera. And or other other issues um, that could be dealt with very quickly if if you had a housing first option in available, which is what they used in medicine, um, medicine app, right? It's near Calgary. And in Calgary, their their homelessness has dropped significantly. They now have the lowest number of homeless people in Calgary of any city in Canada, and because they adopted that homelessness. And that they're very clear to say adult homelessness. Okay, as we said, they're, they're, they're night and day differences. But the but the whole the whole transitional issues of the adult homelessness has really happened when when they started just absolutely wholesale closing of, of a number of institutions, of psychiatric institutions, um, you know, regional regional sort of places, and a lot of places like that. And they just closed them down willy nilly. Oh, we, you know, we just give them a couple drugs and they'll be fine. And that is where a great deal of them came. And, and the lack of discharge assistance to soldiers. Because uh, when I talked to the fellow in New York and we talked about the number of homeless, they were still overwhelmingly, uh, the number of homeless people on the street were veterans. They had to come back from either the Gulf War or, or whatever the war is, the Vietnam War originally, and then there was the Gulf Wars, and, then, and it keeps going on. Well, we now have that too in Canada, because we were in those some of those battles, and uh, we've, we've met a number of veterans over the years. Um, and again, their, their services were cut back. If you, were, if, if you remember that stage of, uh, of uh, Mr. Fantino running away from the, the seniors and the veterans trying to have them discuss it. Um, the other a aspect of it was, was there was a major cutback in assisting Aboriginal housing, and um, as, as probably everyone here knows about, and those things have all compiled onto it. So there's the provincial, the federal, um, everybody's had a piece of this. And um, so it, 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 it was like the perfect storm. And it's why, you know, a lot of us have remember way back, uh, if, if you can remember way back in the 60s, um, there was not a lot of homelessness. There was some, to be sure. But it was, it was a small percentage, and it was very rare in rural areas. And it, and it just escalated. Um, so th so the, the whole issue about what is you know, affordable, homeless, um, affordable housing has also shifted greatly. And that was used to be, it was tied very specifically as a percentage point of your income to what you could pay for a rent or a housing of one form or another. You, I, mean, I, used, I think, used to think it was absolutely hilarious because it used to, it, it, they still say, if you read up on these things, how to create a budget, I love those. And they say, you know, don't, only 25% of your, of your income should go towards housing. So they mean by that your, your rent, your utilities, you know, so that's included, your heat and your electricity and your water, et cetera, et cetera. And it's like, I don't know anybody except for some really wealthy people who have that kind of, you know, percentage where it's only 25%. It's next to impossible to do. Unless you've got two well-paying jobs in your family, in your household, I should say. Um, so it's a very interesting issue. Um, I just want, I'm kind of just, my, I guess my task was just generally give some information about the whole issue. And um, I think pretty much everyone here is familiar with the whole idea of the social determinants of health. Um, shall I lose a little bit? Please do. Okay. Yeah. 
which was very much examining what the conference court, um, conference board was discussing in their um, issues of, you know, it, and the social determinants of health are very interesting because it was actually created and developed uh, primarily through the WHO, the World Health um, Organization, some years back. And um, I'm trying to remember who else was involved, but WHO kind of led the charge. And what they determined through, um, uh, through a lot of the work was how much, oh yeah, it says over here, defined by the WHO Commission on Social Determinants of Health. Evidence shows that most of the global burden of disease and the bulk of health inequalities are caused by social determinants. Now, um, that is included in brackets, the Public Health Agency of Canada is backed up with that same statement. The most updated include 14 determinants to be considered, and they are, by the way, weighted to some degree. The first one is income and income distribution. Second is ed education. The third is unemployment and job security, and then, then employment and working conditions. And as you go through, and, and it's almost smack in the middle, of the, of the 14 determinants is housing, affordable housing, uh, and, and uh, safe housing is often what is used. Because safe means, you know, they have housing in some of these reserves when you go up north, but it's, it's, you go in and it's absolutely full of mold and there's no running water. That's happening in North Granville too? Yes, I am. So, yeah. we have absolutely it does. That kind of housing here locally. Yes. And uh, so it's just un it's important to understand because what they found was the whole idea of health is so interrelated to all these different pieces that you can't just pull one apart and say, okay, we fixed the housing thing so everything's good now. Because the housing is often tied to how, how's your job security, how's this. And so there is the interplay between all of them. And that when you're actually trying to determine the health of the individual as well as um, uh, the community, um, you actually have to measure all those things. So you have to ask your question, how does North Grenville measure up in that in general? You know, how many, how many places do you know that are too cold in the winter because they can't afford the heat and the rent? Yeah, Obviously yeah. those people are going to become more sick. They're going to have troubles maintaining jobs because they're sick. The kids are going to have troubles going to school because they got sick and they're too cold, but they'll show up at school anyways because that's warm in the middle of winter. Better to get old at school when you're warm, to be warm when you're sick, so that you can give whatever you're sick with to everyone else. Or going to the local youth center because you know you're gonna be warm till eight or nine or six or whatever time that it closes that night. Yeah, so, um, and then, so into, and then when you flow in that into the whole idea of the homeless um, issues, where it becomes another extreme end of that scale. Um, understanding the definition and impact um, of homelessness is, is amazingly complicated and takes, takes a fair bit of time. It's, it's probably everything you've ever thought of, but about 10 times more. And the nuances of it can be quite radical. For example, there's, there is many people, many people will say, yes, you know, it's so many of the homeless that are um, psychologically or psychiatrically ill. And there's a lot of truth to that. But there's a lot of them that are, um, the, the illness has been caused by some of these other issues. Um, so for example, we, we found, again, and I can only talk about the things where, we, where you do those micro studies so that you can actually have some kind of statistic to do. That was done in, in, in um, um, uh, Lanark County because that's the closest that I can really use to compare with you. There was actually one out in BC too, but that's another ball game. And the one that was done, in, and they, they, came, they found kids who had, you know, uh, the one kid who had trench foot because, you know, he, he couldn't take his shoes and boots off, you know, that he had on, and he'd had them on for four months. And when he got to the point where he couldn't walk anymore, um, he finally went to an emergency, and they finally, you know, after nine hours of sitting in emergency in Perth, somebody finally saw him, and they said, oh my God, you know, we were, we're right there. We, they almost had to amputate. And, you know, and he was, and he was simply homeless. And we were talking about couch surfing and that sort of thing. It's interesting. The, the term they love to use in rural areas, most rural areas in the country, if you're a young person, and, you, and, and especially if you're a young person with a family, 
and you don't want to let the town, because small towns know everything and tell everybody about everybody. So you're not homeless, you're camping for the summer. And you're camping until it snows, and you're camping until the ice starts to form on places and it becomes impossible to do anything but go into the city and get to a shelter of some sort. So that's an interesting thing to remember, you know, like, like there are camp, kids who go camping in people's backyards because that's what you do in the summer in small towns. But it's, um, beware of the word camping, especially when you ask them where, oh, who, where are you camping at? And they, they're vague. Oh, it's over on the east side. And that's when you know that it's a precarious housing situation. The um, other thing that was interesting that we were talking about is the whole issue of well, the transference of why it's important for North Granville to step up. Is you know not to say it's any worse than other places. Lauren knows this, this is an issue across the country, but uh, to step up and do something now is because one of the issues when you transfer your and this is what I often say: young people don't go to the city, or homeless people don't go to the city of any sort. Uh, because of just all you like the big flights and flashing and it's, isn't it cool? It's it's because there's the resources are there There are youth shelters there There is there are homeless shelters there And yes, they may be full a lot, but most of the time you can get in someplace Where there is no shelter in Kevin You're stuck You got to find an $80 taxi mm -hmm. Yeah, and um, minutes. Ten minutes. Thank you. So I just want to uh, to um, mention those sorts of things. And one of the things we were talking about on the break is when you lose them and they actually go to the city, um, you really lose them, whether whether you're a youth or an adult, because once they get there, they become very isolated very quickly, and the only ones that they know are other people in the same situation. Who can't really help you, except for how to possibly use more of the resources that are in the community, in, in the city to use. But you lose all of your personal social network. It's gone. So to, to be able to reintegrate and come back to Kempville and have any kind of a meaningful life isn't just a matter of getting a job and down the road. It becomes, no, you have no connection here anymore. You lose it very, very quickly. And that's, that's the great tragedy. And depending upon your age and how deeply you sink into the, the world of being on the streets um, in the city, um, usually you pick up an awful lot of additional baggage that is impossible to get rid of after a certain point. And you certainly don't return back to the town where you come from. So this is like a major resource, you know, that's lost forever. Um, Weekend youth homelessness, um, that was an interesting thing. And I just was going to make one little comment about that. You know, the, the Friday night and et cetera. One of the reasons why a lot of people, you know, you, you, you hear about it, it's, you know, well, it's because of family discord. Just to put it a little more direct, personal kind of connection, one of the things that we, in, in talking to a lot of the youth in different, the different places, whether they're the youth shelters or or the youth centers that I go to, and, and I've met the kids with that, it's like they, they will tell you very clearly, you know, can I stay here till midnight at least? You know, and well, you know, you're, you're actually the age where you're supposed to be sent home early. You've probably heard this now a few times. And you say, you know, your age group is, you know, you're under 16, so you're supposed to go home nine or something. Only the older kids can be here till 10 or 11 or something. And, and after a, few, a while, we tried to find out what, what was the deal, you know? Did they just want to be out with the older kids? Because that's the natural thing an adult thinks. No. It, one girl was very succinct and very clear. No, I don't want to get home before my mother's boyfriend is completely passed out. Drunk. Because if I do, as soon as I go to bed, he's going to get in it with me. So I don't want to go home till he's completely passed out drunk. It's an interesting point. And it kind of gets you now. I wouldn't consider that a secure housing kind of setup. You know, and uh, that girl I, you know, is the perfect person who will sooner or later just run out of options of where she can be on a Friday night late enough 
in a small town. And she will go to the city. So, um, on that note, um, I have provided here a list that I, darn if I remember where I got these. Heather, if you sent these to me, thank you. Uh, I mean, the, the contact. I can tell you where it comes from originally, which is the Good Health in, in a Place Called Rural. And uh, the sheets are here, including the, uh, uh, the printout. Uh, it's www.child-youth-health.net. Highly recommend. There's a lot of material there. But they're very interesting breakdown. And if you take a look at it, it talks about housing, you know, of housing in need of major repair, Ottawa compared to eastern Ontario, two-parent families, um, uh, lone parent families. You know, some of these things are very close to being the same until you start getting into other areas, which again, determinants of health, right? Very, very interesting things. Youth reporting, they have a regular doctor. Actually, the rural areas do better than, uh, than the city of Ottawa. But rate of immunization for measles, mumps, and rubella, uh, quite a bit of difference. You know, the inoculations here are much lower. Well, okay, so then now we get into youth who have not graduated from high school or are not in school. Um, much higher rates of those who leave high school early um, are in the rural areas. That's consistent across the country. I always had to laugh at all the work, extra effort they would put into Toronto all the time, you know, to try to get kids to stay in high school. And uh, the reality was that uh, their numbers were less than 20% dropout. Um, in, uh, uh, I'm not sure what it is here, right offhand. I, I mean, obviously, it's 11% it's, it's here, it says. I can't believe that's true, honestly. It's just too, too, too low. But the, um, I can tell you what it was in Lanark 10 years ago. It was over 35%. 35% dropout rate compared to Toronto's 20. Uh, teenage pregnancy. Definitely higher in the rural areas. Uh, teenage obesity, um, and the secondhand smoke, reporting exposure to secondhand smoke at home, much higher in rural than, than cities. Much higher. Uh, these are the most current numbers. I can tell you the numbers that are often now actually, I found out a couple of years ago now, uh, was numbers that I concocted up trying to figure out from an intensive thing of trying to come up with some sort of an idea to do my calculations on how many youth are in fact uh, homeless in, a, in small towns, in rural areas. And basically what, um, what I came up with just by luck more than anything else was that if you look at where everyone, take a look at the sign, the population sign as you drive in, whatever thousand that is, so you per 1,000 multiply it by three. So if you have 15, thousand people for this population you could and you multiply that by three you can absolutely be sure there is no less than 45 to 50 youth who are homeless that's youth and youth by my measurement was under 20. Um, that is a very very consistent number it shows up i've used it across the country and everybody actually queen's university now teaches their social work students that you, you have to be using that. So um, if you have a strong youth center, an active youth center, and a good uh, relationship within the, in that community with uh, some of the schools and social services, that number can actually come down a little bit to about 2.2. Like we were saying, you were saying, it's tough to deal with the youth homelessness issues compared to the adult. So to go to one of the main things I'm supposed to do is talk about the recommendations of, the, uh, of what the committee came up with. I would suggest you take a look at them. To read through all of them, I would have used up almost the whole time. There's, there's nine of them, and they are very complicated. And I hope from that background that I just discussed um, of this, it's part of the reason, and it was part of the preamble, as we called it, in, in the actual final report. And the copies are, can we get a website that people can go look at it if they wish? Or if they want, leave me an email and I'll send it to you, okay? Because it's, it's important. I'm just going to highlight two or three important issues. 
Some of the issues that we talked about is when they were talking about percentages and, and, and allocations of how much affordable housing was to be built within it, um, there was a little bit of effort of, of trying to determine what did that make sense of and how to define the word homes of, of affordable housing. And we understood that's a moving target. So something like that in terms of determining um, uh, what is the percentage of people with household incomes below X, that X is something you have to review very regularly, probably almost annually or every few years at the very least to determine because what was affordable, um, you know, what was an income that you could live on before for two or three years ago, it's very different than what it is now. And that has a lot to do with the cost of housing and rent, et cetera, rather than, than actual how much your income is. Your income is probably the same, same or lower, but the cost of housing is actually higher. So there has to be that differential, and it has to be reviewed regularly by the municipality to determine that. And just one point in the affordable housing, um, hydro is almost never included in rent because it's so volatile. Yes. And landlords would be on the hook for really exorbitant yeah. costs. But that pre all of the apartments without hydro included are pretty much precluded from someone who has insecure housing from going to because they can't afford that volatility. Yeah, exactly. And, and uh, yeah, those, so yeah, thank you. And, and that's a really important point. And, and by the way, most quote uh, rentals nowadays, especially, um, they because it's just easier for the landlord. They they make them all with those little uh, wall register electric heaters, baseboard. baseboard heaters. Guess what? That's the most expensive way you could ever heat a place. So for your so the most expensive way to heat a place is what they put into affordable housing. Doesn't make much sense, you know, because it automatically becomes the problem of the person. So there is also the issue of there are surplus lands and such in this area uh, in North Grenville that could be looked upon and viewed as potential places for um, um, uh, new developments, etc. Um, and we looked at different percentages, and again, I thought the percentage of, generally speaking, new housing developments, etc., should look at least 25% of the housing being built should be affordable to within that. And uh, which is interesting because it, um, and without getting into it, I have a lot of uh, personal involvement and experience in the great social experiments of building um, areas of a town or a city for with affordable housing. And you know, basically they become slums very quickly. And um, and it, it's been proven to not work over time and time and time again, and for a variety of different reasons. It's not because of the people who move in, it's because of, you are, you're basically isolating people who don't have resources into a place that has even less resources. And it makes no sense to do that. So the, the, um, uh, the new system that a lot of people are trying to do innovatively is you integrate affordable housing within every neighborhood. So it, no one neighborhood is branded, you know, social housing areas, et cetera. And it, it's, it works a lot easier and, and has much greater success. The other thing we asked very specifically was also in terms of the proposed recommendations that we were asking them to review and change, we asked them to please take away and remove all of the um, passive numbers, uh, names and information uh, statements like may meet and may assist and change them to shall meet and shall assist and will do this. Um, that's very important. It, it's, it's, it's a great little slippage that people can get away with if they don't follow through because, oh no, no, it just said we may or we'll try. And no, you do it or they can be fine for not doing it if you're housing development. So very quickly, in the very last two minutes that I don't have, um, I'll, uh, I'll uh, wanted to talk about the uh, what can you do, and that was one of the things that was important. Um, as citizens or uh, and just anybody in the community can do. One is please find a few minutes 
to go search out the actual recommendations or just take my word for it, they're really important, you should support them. But you probably should read them over yourself. And um, <coughs> pick up the phone and call your local counselors and say, look, I'm aware of all this, are you supporting them all? And MPs and MPPs. Yes, and that was my second term. First your counselor, because this is what's in front of them very soon that they have to deal with. You should also say, and call your MPP, and MPP, right? So the person who goes to Toronto, and then the person who goes to Ottawa as your representatives, they both have a hand in this. And that's exactly what the uh, conference board and the municipalities uh, groups have all said. It's, it's because all these different groups have negate, uh, just, just tried to download responsibility time and time again for the last 20 years or more that we're in this situation where there isn't enough affordable housing. There is an importance that we didn't put in here. One of the things that really try to promote with them is to entrench policies. Again, don't let them be wishy-washy. These are, you must do these, preferably with some sort of a, um, a decisive and punitive dollar value attached if you don't as developers. Um, we found, by the way, in a lot of different research, and I always love this, uh, I, did, I did a lot of work with the UN's, uh, WHO and things, and on a number of things, and one of the things they said, awareness is great, and it makes a lot of people feel good. It basically, as, as a society, it doesn't work at all. It's totally useless. You have to have it as something that's a firm policy, and it works. So, um, so encourage that sort of behavior with your politicians about affordable housing. Um, inform yourself on the actions and new policies of businesses and NGOs that are in your area and, and systems of things that they may be doing, um, as pathetic and little as they may be sometimes. But for example, um, there's help for low-income households. Does anybody know much about this? This is from Ontario Hydro. Hmm? Oh, I got one with my bill. There you go. Take a look at it. You would be, you'd be surprised how many people are eligible for like 30 bucks off their hydro, which means a lot if you're uh, in, in a category of needing that sort of support. But more importantly, make sure you tell people who really could benefit from this. Because it's a two minute process to go online and do it. It's amazingly easy. Um, the other thing, and I think that's all citizens, not just those who are in the referral business, that's in all citizens' um, responsibility to do that. Um, if you can't make a phone call, write a letter to your counselor and say you really want them to adopt these uh, recommendations. Um, again, the general rule of thumb I've been told by politicians is for every one letter that they receive, they know there's at least 10 more people out there that are as equally as concerned and passionate that they just didn't get to the letter. And that that, that voice is actually um, uh, speaking on behalf of a lot of people. So when they actually get a letter, they pay attention. If they get several letters, they really pay attention. You think seven or eight letters doesn't make a difference? Politicians know this is like the tip of an iceberg, and they start paying attention very, very quickly. Um, and then finally, I think it's very important to support local, local initiatives that also have impact on housing options and abilities to remain in housing that you may have as unaffordable. So like the new reuse shop. Reuse, right? Restore. Restore, pardon me, the restore. Um, shop that's opening, yes, with the gentleman, it's another manager, yay, and you have one, that is, goes a long way. And um, if it's anything like the other stores that I know of, like in Brockville and, and Smith Falls, uh, it becomes its own little social center to help all sorts of people and, and things. The other thing is, of course, Habitat for Humanity um, is in this area. Is that, are you the main contact, Heather? Who's the main, did anyone know the contact for that? Mario. Okay, Mario, yeah, okay. And um, you know, get involved with those groups um, and uh, in any way you can, or if just supporting them would be helpful. But those are all active things you can do, but I think the most important thing is pick up the phone and call your local council member and get have a chat. And I, and I think the more you may have that very clear, you don't have to have a long chat, you know, but be very clear, how are you voting on this? You know, don't let them weasel, oh, you know, after you, no, 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 no. How are you voting? I want to know. Be and I want to know before the next election. 